What's up, Brian? Hey, hey, Bobby. Welcome to part two of Negotiation Tips and Tricks. If you're just tuning in and you didn't listen to part one, stop now and go back and listen to part one. We released it a couple days ago on our podcast. In that episode, we talked about three situations that we've probably all been in as tech sellers where we were negotiating with a customer and probably were on our heels more than we were on our toes leaning into that conversation. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about the tactics that we would use to overcome those situations, lean in more, and hopefully, quote unquote, win the conversation with the customer. Perfect. But first, Bobby, let's talk about the tools page. Uh, again, as we talked about on the last episode, this continues to be the number one uh, hit part of the websites. Uh, we love that. Please continue to give us feedback. We want to build tools. We like to build tools. So keep pushing those suggestions our way. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of um, tools today. The first one is the listener's choice. So our first listener's choice was around perfect prospect correspondence. We built out a number of email templates, part one and part two. So definitely check that out. Um, I think you'll really get some value out of that. And please share us your templates as well. If you've got a good email template that's working for you, uh, let us know. Brian, wasn't it just this week, too, that one of our listeners sent us an email and we actually built them a custom tool and sent it back to them? So if you're out there yep. and you have a, have a need, shoot us a note, info at bobbyandbrian.com. We'll dialogue with you about it. And if we think that you need help, we'll build you a tool and shoot it out and then we'll share it with the public as well. So don't hesitate to get engaged. Indeed. All right, Bobby, so uh, we're going to cover three tactics today uh, that we're going to give some feedback on. So the first one is, uh, I like this visual that you paint. Um, you basically have an abacus of things that you want to barter with. I call these poker chips. You call it an abacus. So why don't you share what that means to you? Yeah, for the young kids out there that didn't grow up putting a tape in a player to watch the movie on the big screen at your house, that's called a VHS. And, and if you were born in the 50s and 60s, you probably used an abacus for math. An abacus is really just a row of beads, and each bead has a weighted value of some sort that you slide back and forth to do math problems with. But it's the visual that I, I like to use on what am I willing to slide back and forth with the customer to negotiate. And there's all kinds of things that you can have. We're going to list some here. We'll put them in the show notes. But there's, there's time. There's money and there's more stuff, right? Customers are going to want a little bit of all three in some circumstances. We'll talk about it later, but a lot of them focus on price. But what are those levers we have? If it's a three-year contract, can we make it a two-year contract? If they want it to really be cheaper, cost them less, can we turn down the time on it? If they want it to be cheaper, can we take some of the functionality away so that's less product? And then... There's always going to be some training, some maintenance, some ongoing support. Can we turn any of those things off to make them cheaper? Now, if you can't, that's a question that you need to deal with with your business. But you don't need to have all these figured out before you go to the meeting as if they're approved from your management team. But you do need to know what you're going to offer and barter with. So I like the visual of thinking I have a multi-year contract. Maybe I'm starting with four, and if I take two years off one side and move to the other... That's what I'm able to give up and negotiate. Brian, anything come to mind that I haven't mentioned that's on your abacus that you might slide back and forth? Yeah, I, I tend to work with companies that are um, companies that are in kind of hyper growth mode. So uh, the, the um, cost of growth is always a concern or a question or something that's in the back of their mind that maybe we've negotiated or haven't negotiated with. So that tends to be something I'll... Um, that's on the abacus. That's on the list. Uh, contract terms. Um, look, there's this. There's the actual contract of doing business with a company, and then there's actual the commercial part of it as well. Um, a lot of times you can have changes on one but not on the other. So I'll I'll use that as as a bit of a slider. Um, broader skew commitment as well. So maybe we're talking about um, a set of products, but maybe there's some products that are going to be planned to be used the next year or the following year. We can talk about when some of those products start and stop. Um, so yeah, I keep a running list, Bobby. Um, it's important to know what we have played and what we have not played. Uh, and more importantly, like where does it add value um, in the negotiation process on both sides? No doubt. And one thing we haven't talked about, I think we talked a little bit about it in part one, but 
there's a financing capability probably from a bank or they may have another financing arm where if it's a, a cash flow problem, they only have X to spend this year, then maybe we could finance it. The other option is to split up the payments, whether it's financing or not, right? Sometimes businesses want all their money up front. Uh, maybe we could just break those payments out, make it three equal annual payments that would ultimately get it into their budget. The other thing that I rarely see pushback from teammates and people that have worked for and around me is is I'm willing to have a negotiation around price if I can speak to someone above you. Everybody inside of a company, all the way to the CEO, has a level of empowerment. And the person above them has more empowerment. The CEO can get more money from the board. And if I'm not sitting at the board t- boardroom table with all the boardroom members, there's still someone else that can put more money in that budget to buy my product. No questions. Would you agree with that? Yeah, Bobby, I completely agree. And I think it's, um, I try to learn that as early as possible in the, um, the sales process. Uh, who's, who's got access to the budget? What's the largest deal they've ever done? Um, do they work with a steering committee? I just want to understand all of those variables because to your point, um, it, it's not always necessarily that person that, that is going to be writing the check or signing off on the project. And a lot of times it's going to be the largest project they've ever done. So um, maybe they're not even sure what it needs to route through for approval. So uh, I agree. I want to measure all those things before I get uh, too far down the negotiation process. All right, Bobby. So the second part of this um, we're, we're deep stage in negotiation. Uh, we've got some gives. What are some things that you ask for on your side? What are some What are some things that you request of them if you're going to be doing a lot of giving? Good question. I think that it's something that very few tech sellers use because they're so. They I think they always see how close they are to getting the deal done that they don't want to slow it down any bit more. But the the obvious one is another year of whatever commitment they're willing to make. It's t- time is valuable in our world. Technology is changing so fast. The competition's out there. I want to be a partner and or vendor to this customer for a long, long time. So I would think first and foremost, the length of the contract would be one thing that I would start asking for. If, if it's not the length of the contract, it would be the commitment to the portfolio. Um, go back to our Microsoft days. Most customers were either Windows customers or Office customers or Windows and Office customers. But the future of Microsoft was all those other things, Windows Server in the data center, SQL Server for databases. So I would keep trying to get them to to commit to more of my platform, whether it's the Microsoft example or not. It's more about what my company can do for them so that I can block out some of that competition. I might ask them for a customer reference. Maybe it's a phone call to another customer. Maybe And maybe it's not the right time to do that, but I would say, okay, if this is the last thing we're going to negotiate on or topic that we're going to have, I'll do it if you'll commit to having a customer call with three customers over the first quarter after we implement the project successfully. That That's very specific and specific for a reason because if they just agree to do a customer call, it could be one and done. So I want to make sure that I'm asking for more because I can bet we're going to negotiate on that topic as well, right? And so if I start at three, I'm probably going to get the two that I really want. And if it's not that, maybe marketing has uh, some events that they're trying to get some executives to. I'll get buy-in and participation in those events. I might get them to send some of their team members to my global conference, kind of like Dell EMC World coming up in um, the May timeframe in Las Vegas, and get people to the, participate in those events so that they can see and learn more. If they are there, I know I'm going to be able to sell them more stuff. So those are just a few off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I've got a couple more, but first, that, that, something you said stood out to me. Um, we've we've all been in the position where the asks continue to build and build and build and build, and um, I think what I've what I've become much better at these days is is of course along the way there's going to be asks and it changes and adjustments, but when we're in the final stage of negotiations, I want to know exactly what it is we're negotiating over. And it's got to be a set list on their side. It, we can't we can't string the requests out again and again and again. That's not a it's not an honest way to do it in my in my opinion. So I want to know what are what what changes adjustments. What do you want to see happen on contracts on commercial terms? Uh, you know contract length. I want to know what is what is the full set we're looking at, 
so that I can respond appropriately. But if we're if we're dragging out requests again and again after we've had that quote, quote, kind of final conversation, um, I'm going to come to a stop until we get to the point to where we really are at the final. But a couple other things I'd add to that. Well, one more thing to your point there. That might be the best tip of these two-part series is to say if you don't start with that list, you're probably going to lose the negotiations because you are going to get strung along because it's kind of like what I said in the earlier part about asking and asking and asking until I got to know. That's kind of setting the precedence that once you share this list with me, that's the list we're going to negotiate or we're already at no. So that's a great tip. That might be the best thing of this uh, podcast. A couple of other things, Bobby, that I'll mention, uh, but you alluded to several of these. A joint case study. I mean, it, it's a great, you know, there, there's some press out there about them growing and changing and about them using our company. It's a great opportunity for us to get some good joint press, so I'll ask for that. I'll ask for executive sponsorship on their side. I want the project to go well for them. In order for it to go well for them, we need to work with executives on their side to support and sponsor the project. Um, favorable contracts, uh, the cleaner the contracts are, the better the attorneys like that. Uh, that just makes everyone's life better. Um, so those are the core things that I'm, I'm looking out for, Bobby. Perfect. And I think the, the final tactic and or set of tips that we have for this conversation is really how to, how to get the customer to stop talking about price. We used it in both a situation and in part one, and we're going to use it as a, a way to give you guys some tips and tricks. So, I don't always think it's about price. I just think that's what we've educated our customers on uh, negotiating with us on. So when they, when you meet that first IT director or CIO or someone in IT or the business that just wants to know how much is your product per pound, I, I normally try and put that back on them. What, what would you be willing to pay? What do you think it's worth? And that really sets me up for a place to understand what they think the value is that I do bring or don't bring to the table. Um, it, they, they normally will start with some low ball number and I, I would start with a conversation about just how much they would value they would get out of those low ball type items. One story that I tell a lot of people when we talk about price is I was negotiating, negotiating with an oil and gas company here in Houston towards the end of my time in the field at Microsoft. And it was 2007, 2008, probably the second worst downturn. Well, it was the second worst downturn in my lifetime. Probably the second or third worst downturn in the oil history was the 2007-2008 time frame. And the customer said, we're cutting everything. We cannot afford to renew our agreement with Microsoft. And of course, I worked at Microsoft and I thought that was crazy. And we ran the math and they wanted it to be cheaper and cheaper. And they wanted to remove more product and get cheaper and cheaper. And it was odd. About halfway through the conversation, they offered me a cup of coffee. And we went down to the break room and we got some coffee and we came back and I didn't pay for the coffee and they didn't pay for the coffee. And I asked them to just run an ROI for me on how much their company was paying for coffee. We did a little bit of work on how many divisions they had, how many branch offices they had, and that they paid coffee for everybody in every location 365 days out of the year. And I got to a point to where my Microsoft agreement was cheaper than the coffee was. So I told them, why don't you quit buying the coffee and buy my Microsoft agreement? It's got to be more valuable to you than coffee. And I think people really forget that there are things that companies are spending money on, like the coffee, that is always negotiable. And, it's, and your product is as well. But if you could put together a story that says the coffee costs 50 cents a day, 300 days out of the year, that's more than $150, then I'm asking you for less. It's a good way to put in perspective how valuable your product is versus the price that they want to keep talking about. Yeah, I, I take a similar approach. Uh, I love that. I love that story. It's a great one. I've not heard that one. I think the, the approach I tend to take, and it's very honest, is um, and I, I always tell it as we start an evaluation, is that it is, it is my job. It's the account manager's job. It's our solution consultant's job to show you why our product can deliver a strong ROI and help you grow your top line revenue and not grow your back office, um, which will help our products pay for itself. If we fail in our job in doing that, you won't buy our product. So it, the onus is on us to show you how we, how we can deliver that. We're never going to be the cheapest. Um, and many times we will be the most expensive and sometimes it's by multiples, but it is, um, it's, 
it is on us to help accomplish that. And I think what it helps the prospect do is really see us in the in the light that we want to be seen in. It also puts a lot of sharpness and in, in causes us to have a lot of sharpness on how we execute as well. It, it sets the bar very high. But it, it tells the customer right away that they're not dealing with a commodity product, that they're dealing with something that's premium on the market. No doubt. And I think that goes back to value versus price or value versus cost and what their perception is. Uh, if it's so low that it's not worth even talking to them, then that you got to get to a point where you walk away. So yep. something we were going to tease in part one and we didn't, but I'd like to wrap it up with today in part two is what I think is the most important part of all of this. And I've had this question about negotiation come up a few times and people always think that I'm skilled and talented, have that, that, that gift to gab. And that's why I'm so good at this. I don't believe that. I actually argue that because while I am pretty good at gabbing, it's the practice that I've put in. Brian, how much do you practice your ability to be a triathlete? A uh, dozen hours a week, probably. A dozen hours a week. And is that like yeah. walking fast somewhere? Or, or <laughs> would you consider those dozens of hours a week like pretty much at your threshold? I'd say many of those hours are close to threshold. Yeah. And I have a couple of hobbies, golf and flying, and, yeah. and I practice them both. I, I spend a lot of time on the driving range. I spend a lot of time thinking about flying, and I spend a lot of time in the plane to get better. I actually might go fly in the dark tonight to – get some of my night recency done. But the, the three things that we're most passionate about outside of family and our religion, it, it really does take a lot of practice. And if you're a pro, you got to practice. Uh, I, I used to use a Tiger Woods analogy all the time, and it may, he may be coming back to help me use it again one day, but it is. How many times does Tiger Woods, the, the, the almost greatest golfer in the world all time, spend still practicing? A lot. Um, I spend a lot of time practicing my talk tracks for negotiations with customers. I don't go into a meeting without being very well prepared. My moleskin's full of little notes and ideas. I've got a list of things that I'm willing, a full abacus of things I'm willing to give and take and um, negotiate on so that we can get to a mutual win-win. But this does take practice. If you don't have somebody to practice with, Suit us a note. I'll spend some time practicing with you. But at the end of the day, if you want to be a great negotiator, I think it all starts with practice. How do you practice your negotiations, Brian? Well, it's, um, as I mentioned in the previous podcast on this one, I, I keep a running list of everything we've done throughout the evaluation. And then I put that into a presentation. And that work alone helps set me up with um, where we're at today what chips we have left on the table. And then I and then I work on the small things because the small things multiply. It's 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 not overdressing, it's not rushing it. It's allowing silence in the room. It's not piling on points in the room. It's ensuring that when we have that final negotiation meeting that we keep it a small room. It's th- those are all planning pieces. Those are all uh, things that I'm very uh, deliberate about. Um, and it leads to greater success. Um, obviously the what is it, the 100,000 meeting thing? Um, you know, the more meetings you're in, the better you get at it. But none of those things overcome uh, great practice. For sure. So no excuse for practice. Unless you're striving to be average, which we're completely against, you have to practice. And I just gave you an out to call me or suit me a note, and I'll practice with you. Uh, we'll make you a better negotiator. So if you like this format, or if you don't like this format, We would love to hear your feedback. Either post it in the comments on our website or shoot us an email at info at bobbyandbrian.com. We will follow up and I'll say thanks in advance. So as we wrap up, as always, until next time, average is the enemy. Thanks everyone for listening. Have a great week.